Hello, my name is Dave Johnson, and this video is created for my Rockbridge Seminary project describing a small group model. This model is really a hybrid of a couple of other models. Uh, I've done some research on the idea of the Jesus movement as put forth by Alan Hirsch, and uh, I've also included some adaptations from a couple of YouTube videos uh, by Roy McClung. These two videos are How to Explain the Simple or Organic Church in Two Minutes on a Napkin and How to Multiply Simple Organic Churches. And I've tweaked those videos a little bit, but uh, you'll see the, uh, the illustrations here shortly. To begin with, though, I want to make sure that we have kind of a good definition, a biblical definition of the church. First time, uh, every time we see the word church in the New Testament, it's always talking about the people of God. And it's never talking about a building or a location. The Bible says that the church prays and it encourages and it loves, and buildings cannot do this. So we must agree that the church equals the people of God. So with that understanding in place, let's talk about a couple of structures. Uh, the simple church structure well, all church structures really begin with Jesus at the center. And if we lose that foundation, then, we, then we're really in trouble. But the simple church structure, I'm going to use a triangle to describe the elements of this simple structure. The first two come from uh, the Great Commandment, where Jesus says to love God and to love people. And so that's two of our three key elements in the simple church. The third comes from the Great Commission, which is to make disciples. Now, I think every church that you would talk with uh, within the Christian community would agree that those are foundational pieces. To illustrate the more complex, uh, what I call the institutional church structure, I'm going to use a box. And what is added in this structure are buildings, staff, and programs. And because these things are expensive, we also have to add a budget. Now, what I'm not saying is that the more complex church needs to be done away with. What I am saying, though, is there's validity in a simple church structure that doesn't have those additional things, but still retains the key elements that we see in Scripture as to how we are to be the church. So, now let's take a Another look at a kind of organic structure, if you will, and I want to use the first illustration of just a biological family. In a biological family, you have uh, typically a couple of parents, and hopefully those parents are fairly mature. Additionally, the family will have children, and those children will be at different levels of maturity, uh, based on age primarily, but other factors as well. And the role of the parent is to encourage and to nurture and to equip to bring those children uh, to higher levels of maturity. And the ultimate goal, of course, is for them to be able to then go out and start families of their own. Now, if we look at the church family, we see a very similar structure. There are uh, a couple of folks that are going to be more spiritually mature a little further down that road, and the Bible calls these people elders. Also within the church, there are a number of other folks, and they are all at various levels of spiritual maturity. Now, the elder's role, again, is to equip and to nurture and to guide to help these folks become more spiritually mature. What just makes sense naturally is that they would then be able to go out and make other church families. This is the essence of disciple making, to bring people along to the place where they can then go out and do the same for others. So, let's talk about the idea of multiplication. What we typically see described as multiplication is there's a leader who gets a couple of other folks together. And after a while, that group begins to grow. Eventually, what ends up happening is it's really no longer a small group. And so at that point, the leader says, you know, I need to equip another leader. And then we're going to split these groups so that then they can go on and continue to grow. Of course, after a while, we've got the same problem again. And so we repeat the process of developing a couple more leaders and then splitting again so that they can continue to grow. 
The only problem with this idea of multiplication is people hate it. Nobody really likes the idea of dividing in order to multiply. Even though we would agree that growth of the kingdom is a good thing, this way of going about it just goes against what we enjoy. And so what we have in these scenarios is somebody who is over in this group says, you know, I really want to be in that group with those people, but I really don't want to lose this group either because I love these guys too, and it just creates a mess. Well, maybe there's another way. And I'm sure I'm not the first person to think of this, but I just haven't seen this anywhere else. But let's go back to this idea of the church family. And in this structure, you've got a couple of leaders, and then you've got others in the group. And again, the idea of these leaders is to help these others to mature and grow, to be able to then go out and start another family of their own. In this idea, what I want you to see is that that person then goes into this other family and they begin to recreate the same process, gathering a couple of more people around them and helping them to mature as well. If each person in this core group, and no, not everybody will do it, so I'll leave one blue, all right? But if each person in this core group or most of them would go out and then do the same thing, what you begin to see is multiplication. However, it's important that the people in the core group stay with the core group. Going out and reproducing this is hard work. It's difficult, and you need that core group of people still around you to help support you and to help you through the struggles and to celebrate the good times with you. So in this model, you never have to leave your core group. All you have to do is commit to be in two groups. Your core group, call that the first generation group, and one more group that you start call that the second generation group. If you see in this model what I've shown you so far, each of those people is still only committed to being in just two groups. But then the process continues to take place as these other groups are matured and able to go out and do the same thing. And we then get third generation, fourth generation, and so on. What you can see here is this is multiplying the effect over and over and over again. But I want you to notice that in each of these scenarios, one, I've only used two, at the most three people in the group uh, to illustrate this multiplication, but two, in every single scenario, each individual is only in two groups, their core group and the one that they start to then pass it on. And the growth begins to be exponential. Now, let's talk about getting started with this idea. First, it's quite simple. You just commit to meeting with a few other folks. And so uh, as you do that, then you worship together, you pray together, uh, you share meals together, and you have a good time. Uh, so that it's one of these things that's really organic uh, is kind of a current term, but it's, it's just natural. Keeping in mind the primary goal is to make disciples is to help people grow to the point where they can start that second group uh, that they can begin and begin to have true multiplication without any division required at all. Also, if you're in a scenario now that already has a church structure to it and maybe even small groups, just share this with your current leaders. Share this presentation with them, this video with them, so that they can get an idea of what we're talking about. And also remember, don't rush the process. This is not about how fast can we multiply. It's, it's about developing authentic relationships, disciple making, that takes time. And it takes a different amount of time with different people. So the idea is not how quickly can we grow, but how deep can we grow. In the depth of our growth, then the multiplication will happen naturally. So some issues to discuss with uh, your current leadership if you're sharing it. Keep in mind that what we're talking about here is equipping people, not controlling them. Uh, hopefully what we see in here is that this is not about lording over or that th any of the things like that. Uh, that. We're not trying to control them, but we're trusting God. This also means that we have to trust the Holy Spirit. Yes, we need elders, we need people that are a little further down the road to help us with the rough spots, but we need to also understand 
that these are um, people who also have the Holy Spirit within them and are going to want to see that growth spiritually and numerically take place in a natural way. Ideally, the leaders in your church ought to be the red dots in my illustration. The first people starting some of these core groups and equipping them to then go out and do the same. Now, one other thing that seems kind of obvious, but I think we should discuss, is this is about making disciples, not dependents. Too often in the church, the scenarios that we create, the structures that we use, people begin to get comfortable with the fact that we are spending, as leaders, time with God and in the Word, and then we'll come to them and share with them what God has been telling us. We're making them dependent upon us rather than dependent upon God himself. And so what we really want to do is we need to shift our focus to making disciples, making people who go to God themselves, who spend time with God in prayer, who spend time in their Bibles, and are reading this and allowing the Holy Spirit, as 1 John says, to teach them the things of God. Again, we need those good teachers around us, but we don't want to make dependents of people who are dependent upon us for everything. We want to make disciples so that they are able to then feed themselves. Let me give you a quick illustration. What if there was a, a mom who came to the local high school every week to feed her son or daughter lunch? Now, you would assume one of two things. Either one, the child may be handicapped, and in that case, it would be totally understandable. But in the other scenario, if the child is perfectly healthy, you'd have to say, that mom really needs to teach that child how to feed themselves, right? Well, this is the same thing that we need to do in our churches. We need to make people not dependent on us to feed them week in and week out, but equip them to be able to feed themselves and then be able to go out and help others do the same thing. So there is my model for a simple small group or house church scenario.